Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Beaton Heritage Conservation District Open House. My name is Madeline Gibson. I'm a senior policy planner here with the Town of New Tecumseh and assisting in the management of this project. The staff here who have their video on and Councillor McCullen as well, will go around this and introduce ourselves. So I'll start with you, Councillor McCullen. Thanks so much. Um, my name is Councillor McCullen. This is my first term and I'm the Councillor for Ward 6 Beaton, where the Beaton Heritage Conservation District will be. Thanks so much. And Vanessa, I'll go to you next. Thanks, Madeline. Hi, everybody. I'm Vanessa and I'm the Heritage Lead with the town, also helping with the administering of the Heritage Conservation District. Thanks. Hello, my name is Utemaya Jambatista. I'm with Foten Planning and Design. I'm currently managing part two of the study and I'm collaborating with the ASI team, which uh, leads us to Annie. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Annie Veyer and I'm from ASI and we are um, the heritage specialists on this team, helping Uta with uh, this, the plan. Hello, I'm Christina Martins and I'm also with ASI. Okay, great. And I just, before we start the presentation, I just wanna remind all of our uh, residents, thank you again for coming. During the presentation, we'll just keep our cameras off and our microphones muted until the presentation is over. And then you're more than welcome to turn your cameras off. When you would like to answer a question after the presentation, please raise your hand and we will either unmute your microphone or ask that you unmute your microphone. That way we're not talking over each other. Ute, if you want to start with your presentation. Thank you, Madeline. So um, let me share my screen now. Can you see it? We can, okay. yeah. Perfect. So thank you once again to, to taking the time to, to um, attend our uh, public engagement session. Um, the process has been a long one. Uh, it will be, I guess, our second year now uh, trying to uh, finalize the, 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 the crafting of a, a solid and, and, and complete uh, district plan, conservation district plan for, for the town of Beaton. And uh, we do appreciate you following us through the years, contributing your, your, um, your, your expectations and your uh, opinions, uh, especially affecting or in impacting your, your property in Beaton. So um, tonight's, tonight's meeting will take you through a, a little bit of an overview of, of the current study objectives and process. Then the a ASI team will take us through, through um, the, the, the parameters and the discoveries and the, the research they did from, from the heritage perspective. During part B, we will introduce you to the layers of um, policies, definitions, and guidelines that go into building the, the guideline document. And finally, we will conclude with an implementation, implementation section where um, we, we introduce the heritage uh, conservation district uh, process, as well as the resources and the policy updates that need to take place so the actual guidelines can make sense and work within the context, the larger context of the town's uh, land use policies. So currently the, the, the phase two of the ACD process, phase one, by the way, um, if you recall, was the process of defining the actual boundary. Um, what you have in front of you at this point in time is the defined HCD, beaten HCD boundary that came out from the study conducted during uh, phase one back in 2018. There was a complete, really complete report on, on, on the reasons why the boundary looks like the, the way you see it now. And we started with a slightly different boundary back then. And um, the boundary got approved by council and uh, now we are in part two. Part two is very important in the sense that um, it, in order to implement a, a heritage conservation district, you have to have 
implemented a clear set of guidelines on what you want the district to 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 have as uh, and and offer as as guidance to property owners. So without one couldn't really really be implemented without the second phase. So right now we we develop a defensible boundary the way you see it. The, it's defensible from from the land use and heritage perspective in that it's a cohesive reading and cross section of the history of Beaton from its core, the commercial core to the Freyer grounds, to the residential on, on, on Central Street. Um, so once, once the, the, the boundary was approved by council, we, we undertook the, the task of developing the guidelines in accordance to the Ontario Heritage Act, which is basically uh, the act that governs any sort of uh, efforts to preserve and conserve heritage, um, and built heritage and cult cultural landscape heritage components in, in our cities and towns, as well as industry best, best practices and how to uh, preserve and conserve and, and, um, and enhance uh, built heritage features and, and buildings. So the, the, the current work uh, study plan and schedule took um, uh, place during three phases or steps, we call them steps. Um, with, with COVID, we, we hit a little bit of a, of a gap in, in our process, but in, in a nutshell, we had a first phase where we did all the policy review and the ASI team went into really dissecting all the properties within the boundary shown and, and, and ascertaining whether they were contributing and support, supporting properties. And, and Annie will take you more through that process. Uh, during that, specific step, we had a series of consultation sessions, one with stakeholders, uh, one uh, when we were able to, back when we were able to meet in person at the library, we had, we had an online survey, some common boards that we left at the library, and we had our first steering committee presenting the, the findings and the initial steps that we, we were proposing at, back in the fall of 2019. Uh, for step two, we started to craft the, the, the district objectives, the policies and guidelines that go into uh, putting together a guideline document. We also took a, a look at, at what land use policies and bylaws, as well as official plan and any other layers of uh, uh, land use legislation that needed to be reviewed and revised to ensure that what we are asking in our current um, guideline doesn't uh, preclude or it doesn't um, negate what, what the parent bylaw is already calling for, anything from fencing to, to signage bylaws or whatnot. Um, during step one, we, we conducted a second series committee meeting, still in person, and we had then numerous staff uh, meetings now we entering the, the lockdown, the COVID lockdown uh, via Zoom in, into trying to perfect and, and further discuss the amendments that need to take place to, to implement this program. And finally, we, we, we are at step three where, where it's important we completed the guidelines, we completed the series of objectives and policies, and we're coming back to you, especially uh, property owners to to uh, present the framework that we are trying to implement, the reason on how we are structuring it, and uh, with the hopes of presenting to council by, by, by the end of this year. So you can actually have a final document, hopefully uh, starting next year. So with that, I will um, let Annie uh, start presenting her components. Thanks, Uta. Um, so um, I will bring you through some of the research and findings that came out of the study phase in terms of uh, the significance of the Beaton HCD district and the, the, the boundary and some of this information. So first, um, the statement of significance for the HCD was developed during the HCD study phase. It was based on extensive historical research, site visits, uh, conversations with local historians, with the community, as well as with the steering committee and staff. 
Um, the lands within the proposed HTD boundary are centered on the historical and present day commercial core of Beaton. Uh, they're comprised of transitional but cohesive mixed use areas featuring a range of residential, institutional and commercial properties on Main Street West and Center Street North. This area is of historical value as it contains a concentration of heritage resources and groupings of elements that are associated with um, Beaton's earliest and most significant town builders, such as Robert Clark and D.A. Jones. It's associated with early industries critical to Beaton's development, such as agriculture and apiculture. It's also associated with pivotal events, such as the Great Fire of 1892. Uh, that fire dramatically impacted the physical fabric of the community and has led to what uh, the, the commercial core, the, the historical commercial core of Beaton looks like today because of what the building that happened after that fire. Um, and the fire also impacted the community and lives of, um, of many of the residents. Um, and it's also associated with enduring traditions and events such as the Beaton Fall Fair and community gatherings along Main Street and in the, the vicinity of the town hall and the fairgrounds which strongly contribute to the social fabric of the area. Next slide, please. Um, some of the key attributes that were identified include buildings and landscape features associated with D.A. Jones, associated with a period of prosperity for Beaton both before and after the fire of 1892 um, that was identified as being significant and also uh, associated with Beaton's agricultural history. Um, Another attribute is the representative range of buildings that is was needed to support a self-sufficient 19th century com community. So we see residences, we see commercial properties, we see institutional properties, all with a consistent archite architectural style, construction materials. You see a lot of this red brick that was um, made from bricks that were uh, built, created locally. Um, and uh, similar composition all within the mid to late 19th century. Another attribute is uh, a number, there's a number of landmark properties within the area, including the Town Hall, the Muddy Waters, the former Orange Lodge, uh, Trinity United Church, the former Traders Bank, uh, and also the former location of the Queen's Hotel, which is now a vacant lot, and of course the fairgrounds. Um, another attribute is the historical downtown, the commercial street cape, streetscape, which has a consistent building height, consistent materials, and public realm amenities, such as the lovely um, cast iron light standards and, and benches. And there's a, a lack of, um, for example, the you know wooden hydro poles with overhead wires that really uh, give this area uh, that historical downtown feel. Center Street, the residential streetscape, including its mature tree canopies, is, a, is another key attribute. Um, views have been also identified as attributes, so views of the Town Hall, the Jones Block. So the Jones Block is uh, uh, the block of uh, commercial properties along Bain Street that are um, of red brick. Um, uh, in the downtown core. Um, you see these views when you're entering the community from the east along Main Street. It's a lovely view as you come in. Uh, a key attribute also is all the mature trees along Center Street and within and surrounding the fairgrounds, which are directly related to D.A. Jones. Uh, and also the network of historically established open spaces and recreational areas that form uh, the community and civic core defined by the town hall, the fairgrounds, the arena property, the cenotaph and the library. Um, the, the proposed HCD boundary uh, as a result of information collected during the study phase uh, and also included uh, community consultation. Uh, it includes the historical and present day commercial core of Beaton along Main Street West and also includes a mixed use area around along Center Street. So this mixed use area includes um, some houses, but also a former a church, a church, a former bank. There's also a former orange lodge and a former butcher shop. So what this transitional area provided, um, this mixed use area provided the transition historically from the commercial core to the residential area further north along Center Street. Um, the boundary also includes the civic core as described and the the, the fairgrounds which created uh, which creates a, a gathering place for the community. 
Um, so we know that not every property or building within an HCD is going to be of historical or heritage value. So part of our work is to identify those properties that do embody or represent one or more of the key heritage attributes um, of the district. So these we call contributing property and differentiating them from those properties that do not have any of these um, heritage attributes, which we call supporting properties. Um, what we need to understand is that both contributing and supporting properties will be designated as part of the HCD under Part 5 of the Ontario Heritage Act because by virtue of being within the boundary. However, the, the, what's important to note is that the HCD plan is, and the guidelines are being developed, so there are going to be different levels of, of guidelines and policies uh, and approaches to properties, whether they're contributing or supporting. And Uta will be talking about a bit about this uh, a little later in the presentation. So how do we differentiate between contributing or supporting property? Uh, well, we start by looking at property research for individual properties, and then we match it up against key attributes identified in the statement of significance. So for example, two main street is a contributing property because by matching the information we know about it and the attributes, we know that it's built and occupied, was built and occupied by DA Jones, was built in 1894 during a period of prosperity, was, which was identified as being significant and is part of the historical downtown commercial core. Now, 29 Main Street West, based on the information we could pull out for this property, it's not built during that period of significant period of prosperity. It's not associated with DA Jones or the town's agricultural history or any other significant uh, period or event. Uh, and it's not historically part of the, the either the historic downtown commercial core, the civic core, or the center street residential streetscape. And it's also not a landmark. So 29 Main Street is uh, a supporting property. So then we have uh, further classified the contributing properties to aid in the crafting of guidelines for the HCD. So we'll start talking first with um, uh, contributing residential properties. So these are properties that were originally built for use as homes for people residing in Beaton. Uh, the residential properties uh, within the HCD are primarily located along Center Street uh, North, but there are still a few properties along Main Street on either side of the commercial core. So uh, conservation policies and guidelines should be considered for these properties when it comes to um, making alterations or additions such as um, changes to windows, roofs, materials, uh, front and side yard landscaping. Um, and Uta will, will speak more to those in a little bit. Um, another type of property of contributing property are the mixed use or the non-residential properties. And uh, these are buildings that were originally built for commercial, purposes, institutional or mixed use purposes. Uh, they, these buildings generally comprise Beaton's downtown commercial core and are primarily located along Main Street West. And conservation policies and guidelines should be considered when making alterations or additions to these properties, such as um, changes to storefronts, exterior walls, roofs, materials, windows, signage, and uh, uh, these types of um, additions or alterations. Uh, the next we have our supporting properties. So these properties, as I discussed earlier, are not directly, do not re directly represent the heritage value or attribute of the HCD, but they do have the potential to support the character of the HCD should the properties be altered or built on. So that's why we call them supporting properties. Uh, they can have one or more buildings on them. They can be vacant um, or they can be uh, right now are currently being used for parking. So policies and guidelines uh, that address alterations, changes, or demolition of supporting properties um, should be uh, considered. And as well in terms of um, provided guidelines in terms of infill, uh, in terms of street walls, building heights, design, roofing, setbacks, facades, and you know, there's a, a whole list of, of things to consider as part of uh, especially new builds. And finally, we have uh, the public realm, which is a space where communities come together. These places can include open spaces, streetscapes, and civic buildings. Here in the Be Beaten HCD public realm, uh, we have identified streetscapes along Main Street West, Center Street North, and Second Street. Uh, we've identified the fairgrounds, as well as the civic core, which includes the library, the community, um, the arena, the cenotaph, and the park. 
Um, and then conservation policies and guidelines should definitely be considered when making alterations or additions to these uh, properties. So together, the contributing, contributing properties, residential, whether uh, whether residential or mixed use or institutional, the supporting properties in the public realm uh, all come together to form what is the, the Beaton Heritage Conservation District. Um, and now I will turn it back to Uta, who will uh, uh, go through discussion of policies and guidelines for the HCD and the, the different kinds of properties. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, so once, once the, the task of really understanding what elements or what building blocks go into defining um, our uh, historic district, we started to look at, at the content of the guidelines and, 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 and really thinking about the objectives, definitions, principles, and policies that go into supporting this statement of, um, of interest in, in objectives that initially were crafted by, by, by Annie's and Christina's team. So in, in, in the formulation of the guidelines, we, we have two key um, chapters, so to speak. Um, one will be on, on guiding principles and policies that will guide contributing properties, whether they are residential or um, institutional or mixed use. There will be a separate uh, set of guidelines that will guide the change and development of uh, supporting properties. They are so different that they really need their own uh, set of uh, guidance. And finally, there's a set of guidance for streetscapes, which are usually more associated with, with uh, they're under the purview of uh, the township, as well as um, uh, associations like the Agricultural Association who's in charge of the, the fairgrounds. The second or the third chapter, I will say, the, the, the very first chapter will include all the wonderful work that ASI has conducted into understanding the, the building blocks of our own um, or our little um, uh, heritage district. The third final uh, chapter is really a series of implementation recommendations. And, and there are some recommendations that have to be implemented by the town approved by council to really ensure that then the new proposed guidelines and objectives don't, don't, don't fight, so to speak, with current land use policy. We also introduce and explain what a heritage permit process is and how it can function. Um, and we put some other forward, some other um, resources as far as educational programs that really can be uh, are available to anybody interested in in, in into uh, you know working with their uh, heritage building, as well as incentive programs that um, council will be looking at in, in in trying to identify what will be the best way to incentivize the the uptake of of this wonderful program. Um, so um, the statement of objectives introduced in, in, in our um, uh, guideline document really have three kind of paramount um, uh, objectives. The first one is to really conserve uh, Beaton's unique settlement part, pattern and town layout defined by, as, as Annie explained, by the, the 19th century residential and commercial combination of, uh, of uh, buildings on Main Street West and Central Street North. They're obviously uh, tied to the historic past and, and the entrepreneurs that, that made Beaton Beaton. The second objective is to ensure that the, the, the buildings and, and the, streets, the streetscapes and the public realm is really protected and conserved. So so the, the entirety of the character of, of what makes Beaton Beaton, it's, it's, it's maintained and preserved that carry through, through time. And finally, uh, key is the reinforcement of the area's char district character, which is, is, is it builds on, 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 on the manner in, in, the, in which existing buildings look, are situated, are massed, uh, and their height and their proportions. But it doesn't mean that we are freezing what can happen in, in the downtown uh, uh, Beaton area. So there is the need of a, a really good set of guidelines that allow property owners to, to still upkeep and, 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 and work with their properties without freezing them in a specific 
timeline, but also uh, allowing them and giving them all the guidance required. So their, their decision-making process as they go and, and, and design and think about their properties really kind of contributes to, to the process of uh, continuing to build Beachen into an even more uh, a wonderful place. Um, so in, in the crafting of objectives, once, once we have the paramount overarching objectives, we go into the objectives that will pertain to, to the two main buckets of contributing properties, which have a, a heritage uh, 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 attribute in, in, in the bucket of supporting properties, the public realm and the process. So under the contributing properties, we, we really want to uh, retain and conserve and enhance um, the, the, the features of these specific buildings. And the guidelines explain how to do that. Enhance the intersection of Center Street North and Main Street West, having a, a bacon lot. It's a, and being right at the at what we could consider the, the, the easterly gateway to the downtown area. It plays at an enormous important function in, into the shaping and, and, and preservation of uh, the character of the area. And, and finally, we, we are looking into conserving the, 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 the residential and stately um, character of Center Street. For the supporting properties and public realm, we are really um, uh, putting forward one guidelines that will allow property owners to develop, new develop, alter or infill their, their properties in a manner that really starts thinking about how best to fit with the existing context. Um, we, in the process of fitting in, into the existing context, we, we want to obviously ultimately conserve and enhance the character of a streetscape. Uh, a new building is not designed in a vacuum, so it will have to respond to its context. And, and then we, we really just want to uh, provide uh, guidance to uh, what is usually a very well-meaning uh, efforts of, of better a uh, building or in, in um, building a, a new uh, uh, functional building, but, but sometimes that the understanding of where it's located and how it works with the surrounding context is not there. So it's a bundle of, of strategies that hopefully will allow future and current uh, property owners better understand what they can do and how they can go about uh, uh, doing in, in their restoration or, or um, fixing of their buildings. So uh, with this, I will switch to Christina, who will be taking us through through the more um, uh, um, you know, in-depth uh, um, definitions and, and policies for, um, for the historic district. Thank you, Christina. Thanks, Uta. So uh, the, the conservation policies and guidelines that were developed to be specific to the Beaton Heritage Conservation District um, come out of best practices in heritage and use the definitions and principles um, that have been developed at the federal and provincial levels for heritage. So I'll just take you through some of those uh, definitions and principles. And there are terms that you'll see um, embedded within the policies and guidelines. So at the federal level, uh, the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada has um, set up a set of terms to be used around um, conservation and protection of heritage. So conservation is what we see as the umbrella term, and it encompasses all types of actions that are used to protect a historic place so that its life is extended um, over a long period, and what is valued about that place is protected. Within conservation, there's three different um, ways that a a place could be conserved. That could be um, through restoration, which is what people often think of when talking about conserving heritage. We think we, we our minds turn to restoration, which is um, bringing a property back to what it may have looked like in the past. 
so that you're um, revealing or recovering or representing how that place was at a particular period in its history. Um, and that's certainly something that could be done. Uh, the guidelines have generally been developed to focus on preservation. So preservation, um, opposed to restoration is the act of protecting or maintaining or stabilizing what's already there. So not adding anything, uh, not taking things away. So, so really taking care of what's already there and what's already um, seen to be valued. And then in between those is a rehabilitation. And that's when you might take a historic place and make it possible to be able to continue using it um, or having some type of intervention so that a new use could happen. And sometimes these uh, processes happen in combination, um, but just to understand, you'll see the terms conserve in the policies and guidelines, and that's referring to this broad range of things that could take place at a heritage property. Next, Uta. So then the guiding principles in uh, the provincial guidelines for uh, the conservation of historic properties looks at eight different aspects of, of uh, property to conserve and how to go about that. So the principles are uh, primarily based on on respecting things that are already existing or that um, are known about a property. So the first principle is respect for documentary evidence. And that um, speaks to that if you were to restore a property, that it's based on um, known information. So maybe there's a photograph of the property and that's what's used to then decide what should be added or taken away from a property. And that it's not based on conjecture. The second principle is respect for original location. So as much as possible, we don't move um, buildings when we're trying to conserve them um, unless the, there's no other way of saving them. That's sort of the last resort is removing a building from its original location. So we respect the location that the properties are in. And especially within a historic conservation district, um, location is important because it's about all the relationships between all of the properties as well as the individual properties themselves. Uh, respect for historic material is the next principle. And it speaks to that idea idea of uh, like in preservation, uh, repairing or um, taking care of the building materials that are that are already there and um, only replacing them if it's absolutely necessary. So first taking care of, of what already exists. And then like, uh, like that, the next principle is respect for original fabric. So when repairs are made that it's done with like materials. So if you have wood windows, you would be making repairs in wood. Um, if you have a brick wall, you'd be making repairs in brick rather than using an alternative material. Respect for the building's history means that you wouldn't restore a property to um, one period of a building's history if it risks removing pieces of that property that have come to be valued. Um, reversibility is the next principle. And so if alterations um, are made or additions are made to a property, they should be done in a way uh, that they could in the future be removed and that the building could easily be restored um, or returned to its original condition. So um, very uh, uh, sort of hands-off means of, of making additions. And again, if additions uh, or changes are to be made to the building, uh, we look for a principle of legibility so that the new work can be distinguishable from the old. So we don't want to sort of trick people and try to make something look old when it's not. Um, so we're making it distinguishable or legible. And then the last principle is really reinforcing that uh, maintenance that um, with continuous care, then future work is, is not needed. And uh, if we are proactive about caring for our buildings, then they continue on into the future. Next slide, Uta. And so for the Beaton Heritage Conservation District, as part of the conservation strategies, we've developed a set of design principles, which is based on that best practice and specifically applies to the Beaton context. Um, the first 
three principles really reinforce that idea of, of maintenance and continuing to take care of and protect what is already there. Um, so we, our principles are proactive maintenance. So um, really taking time to look at the properties and seeing what's coming before something becomes more of an issue. Um, preservation as a first priority. So when we looked at that umbrella term of conservation and had preservation, rehabilitation, or restoration, uh, the policies and guidelines are geared at um, that preservation piece, which is, is keeping the historic fabric intact as it is through maintenance and stabilization, um, and then repairing before replacement. So like in the conservation principles that we're going to uh, repair something like repairing a window before replacing it with a new window. And then the last two principles um, have to do with um, adding, whether it's a supporting property that's maybe being replaced with an, a new property or additions or alterations to contributing properties. And those, those um, additions into the district should reflect the predominant character of the district. So looking um, to all of the surrounding context, we've developed principles that uh, help uh, guide what the predominant character is, and then that that can be reflected in new additions, and then that um, work should reference and not mimic the the surrounding properties. So taking cues from the surrounding area, uh, but not exactly um, replicating it. So those are the the principles that underpin all the policies and guidelines that then Uta is going to take us through. Thank you, Christina. Um, so um, further to, to the principles that um, uh, Christina uh, explained and the definitions and the strategies on, on conservation, um, we, we crafted the policies, the, the key policies that kind of underpin uh, every single um, um, uh, specialized set of guidelines for, for the different type of properties that we have within the, the, the heritage districts was developed. So uh, when it comes to contributing uh, properties, uh, we, we um, uh, expect pro properties to be maintained. When it comes to uh, alterations and additions to contributing and supporting properties, we, we, we provide guidance expecting that the, the alterations and additions will be developed and proposed in a, in, based on an understanding of, of, of the property and its role and its immediacy to, to its context. Uh, so it, it either um, uh, maintains uh, its, its uh, heritage attributes or contributes if it's a supporting property into the overall uh, uh, attribute of the street. And finally, we put forward guidance for the alteration or, or addition of, of either contributing and supporting properties so we ensure that the physicality and the design of, of, of what's being proposed uh, really ties into the overall cultural uh, district uh, character. So both, um, both uh, the two last uh, bullet points really um, kind of break down how uh, landowners can go about into altering or, or proposing addition into, to their buildings or, or just um, uh, rest, restoring their buildings in a manner that still kind of delivers on, on the overall arching uh, objective of preserving the character of, of the downtown area. So we, de we develop a series of diagrams. We, we were struggling in, 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 in figuring out how to, how to present what it's really a, a really uh, text heavy document into something that's a little bit more visual. So, um, residents can understand what the guidelines will be focusing on. So we develop a set of uh, diagrams that really kind of highlight the elements that the, 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 the distinctive uh, guidelines touch on. Um, the, the elements in the contributing residential and contributing uh, uh, in, uh, institutional buckets really pertain to everything that's really visible from the street 
in this instance, we, we chose to illustrate a corner condition of a, of a, of a home and on, on, on Center Street. So we provide guidance on anything that has to do first with the front setback and, and landscaping of things. So anything related to, to fences, for example, privacy fences, decorative fences, um, anything to do with roofs and parapets, exterior walls visible from, from the streets, obviously ports and porticos, which really define the, the amazing character of center street, windows and doors, additions uh, in the back that could be seen from, from the adjacent street and um, driveways and garages. Um, the, the, a driveway and garage area has one of the most um, uh, impactful uh, um, uh, results in, 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 in the way um, uh, a property can be developed and how it impacts the, the overall streetscape. So we are putting forward a really precise set of, of guidelines in case people is, is, is thinking and changing and, uh, or introducing a new garage or, or um, moving the garage or, or putting for more, more garage areas and driveways. So, so we maintain that pedestrian friendly environment uh, along Center Street. And uh, each map or each diagram really brings us back to a key map where you can see um, where the residential contributing residential properties are located, mainly on Center Street North and uh, on uh, two or three on, on Main Street. When we switched to, to contributing non-residential, we, we chose to illustrate it best through, through the illustration of a commercial block. Um, when we are dealing with commercial blocks, obviously the emphasis will be into um, providing guidance on into all the little elements that go into forming what we understand as, as the storefront. And a storefront is one of the most highly kind of articulated pieces of, of, of uh, architecture, in my opinion, just because uh, it has many moving elements from a base panel to a transom window all really thought of and evolved in from 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 selling products and enticing people into into coming into into a, a shopping uh, uh, um, a business so we we have a section that really takes you through the, all the elements that form a, a, a store from and how to deal with them if you're thinking of changing it um, we also deal with the upper floors and in, in, in the upper floors uh, in combination with the storefronts are important just because uh, what we see as part of uh, our typical uh, Ontario Main Street is really defined by a, a rhythm in how windows are located and how each individual storefront is, 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 is the dimension. So, uh, you you um, will never find an Ontario Main Street where the upper uh, windows, for example, are more of a of a, a horizontal um, uh, uh, proportion than a vertical proportion. So we we do take care into into explaining how how the verticality of a Main Street a commercial building has to be maintained in, in, in the rethinking and, and, and upkeeping of a building. Uh, and finally, um, there could be a potential to, to add, for example, a, a, a story on, 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 commercial, on the commercial block according to current zoning. Uh, so the, the guidelines uh, really look at, at, at the at, at what's already in, in place and how we can put forward guidelines that uh, help that addition really fit into, into the overall uh, sense uh, of character of Main Street. And this instance is, for example, through the implementation of a step back. So that the wall of, a, of an additional uh, floor, for example, doesn't really come to the edge of the building. It's set back. So when you are walking on the street, uh, immediately on, on the sidewalk, you don't have that immediate uh, presence of an additional building. And, and it may be uh, sometimes it's small details that really have an enormous impact in, in how you experience the, 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 a specific place. Um, when we switch to, to supporting properties, we, we decided to tackle, I think, what will be one of the most interesting and, and um, 
and uh, challenging sites once uh, uh, development takes place. That's the corner of uh, Center Street with Main Street. Under uh, using current zoning regulations, we took a stab at starting to outlining how a future building could come in and really start prescribing how we think the, the base of the building should follow the same height of the commercial uh, um, block immediately to the west, how the facade articulation should use that very same rhythm that you see in the, in the rhythm in, in a, a standard typical um, Ontario Main Street uh, uh, format, how the upper floors have to be setbacks, especially when we are transitioning to a low rise um, uh, residential, heritage residential um, uh, building or home like Marty's home. Uh, and then uh, very, very important as well as how you deal with parking and access, how you um, uh, regular, how people access the, the building, where they park, where loading will be located and how that is not really encumbering uh, the main facade uh, uh, along and the corner along Main Street and Center Street. So there's a set of guidelines. Obviously, it's it's because we are dealing more with with future buildings and they're massive. The set of guidelines are completely different from from the set of guidelines uh, developed for for say uh, contributing residential on Center Street. But it's still, I think will leave you and town staff and council with, with some initial tools to really respond to what can be uh, coming down the pipeline in the near future as far as uh, in development interests. Um, and finally, in tackling the public realm, we also chose, I think, one of the, the, the heart of the community, which will be the redevelopment of the arena. So we have the current arena right now, with the uh, former town hall, the library. And we are putting, without actually designing the building, we're putting forward a set of guidelines that will ensure that however and whenever the arena is developed and, and designed, the set of designers really have something to go by. And we believe that um, that pedestrian transparency and connection between Main Street and the fairgrounds and the park has to happen in, in however way the, the future architect decides to, to locate the, 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 the buildings, the future um, arena buildings and maybe a community center or whatever, whatever the program is. The intent is that through, through his design or her design solution, they still maintain that connectivity. Um, the, the development of the civic core will also not only have a one good facade, so there's, there's that continuation and transitioning next to um, the library and the uh, uh, former town hall, but also Second Street presents, uh, will have its own identity and its own face onto, onto uh, Second Street. So the design of buildings also will have to, to understand how to transition to that. Street and finally, we are next or backing or fronting onto the cenotaph. So that's yet another transition that can either happen through open space or through some sort of um, um, you know uh, facade that kind of really looks onto the cenotaphs in, instead of giving its back or or locating a, I don't know a loading area onto into such an important area. Um, the other element that will be interesting for, for the future designers to explore is to really understand how you park and how you can use the parking central parking area as a future uh, space that can be articulated for, for community activities when it's not in use. Maybe it can be a farmer's market or it can be something for, for an activity that further contributes to your um, existing fairs and, and festivals. And it's really not just a kind of a leftover back of things uh, element, but it's also an intrinsic part, a part of how the designer thought about this specific uh, core. So, so you can appreciate that the, the guidelines are quite distinctive for each uh, bucket, so to speak. Um, 
finally, as, as previously explained, we, we put forward um, a, a process in where um, uh, landowners and property owners really will um, better understand in how to go about in, in the process of, of applying for renovations or, or restorations within the heritage district. We, we, we had a series of consultations and, and the issues of how you go about and apply for a heritage permit came up from even phase one, from even before having a, a well-defined boundary. And I think we have been uh, uh, looking for, for precedents and how other municipalities deal with the different types of uh, renovations that you could have in, in a specific building. And also trying to create a system that's not onerous when it doesn't need to be with for a specific um, uh, project. So we we came up with um, with a three kind of a step or level process. Um, one of the main comments that we got through through one of our uh, initial uh, meetings with stakeholders at uh, in the library is that you, you you don't really need to go through an entire per heritage permit process if you're just repaving your driveway, the change in the driveway, just repainting or or repaving or or just really upkeeping your building. So the first bucket will be just basically you don't need a heritage permit. And examples of that is when, for example, you do any uh, inter interior renovation work, installation of utilities, installation or replacement of eavesdrops or downpipes, minus minor repairs to street fronting elements, um, repairs to the internal side of a, or rear facade of a building that's not visible from, from the street, repainting of wood, stucco or metal that was already painted, uh, construction of uh, residential rear uh, patios or decks, uh, repaving of driveways, the soft landscaping that you have in your front lawn or corner lawn, um, and replacement of non-original roofing elements. Um, now, if, if, if a property owner is thinking into getting into a more specific and, and uh, detailed um, restoration or replacement or um, uh, conservation of overall conservation of their building there are two two different ways and levels to go about the minor heritage permit and the major heritage permit the minor heritage permit in a nutshell won't need um, council approval the major heritage permit will need council approval so let me explain in the minor heritage permit, basically you can conserve and alter work in, in, your, in your specific will, building in a manner that it will be a positive or no impact into the overall um, uh, character of the, of, the, of the district. Examples may include the alterations or replacement of the street fronting facade elements like in your porches, or, or a decorated brickwork or window surrounds that really just are being replaced but is still being contributed to the overall character and, and of that specific building and, and the streetscape. Uh, alterations to storefronts. So uh, if, if a new uh, owner comes in and, and they are really thinking to re, re retrofitting and really uh, sprucing up their, their storefront facade, that's, that's one instance alterations to signage, uh, painting of exterior brick surfaces, for example, addition of any new technology like solar panels or any other uh, energy saving uh, strategies that are not seen from the street will require a permit, but basically as part of the regular planning uh, uh, process that you will have to go through to, to obtain a, a building permit you will submit your 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 proposal uh town staff will receive it review it and then inform you of their decision or or uh, revisions to to what you have proposed so you either get a yes in which you get your heritage permit issued or a no in which you had the recourse to go to council and explain why you need to do what you are proposing to do 
in the case of a major heritage permit, I think we are really referring to the major alter alterations and addition additions, removals, or construction of new buildings that have the potential to enormously contribute to, to, to the, the making of the downtown area or to enormously impact in a negative way what, what's already in place. So examples of this include the alteration to buildings or structures visible from the street, uh, additions to buildings visible from the street, re relocation of buildings or structures, obviously demolition of any building or structure and construction of new buildings like the, the corner that I exemplify in, in the previous um, uh, uh, diagram. Replacement of storefronts uh, when uh, for, for a reason, uh, the new uh, property owner or the existing owner wants to completely rethink the, 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 the rhythm and the, the, the articulation of what makes a, surf at a storefront. Um, or you are planning to introduce new and increased parking areas that can have a really detrimental um, uh, uh, result or impact on, on the overall pedestrian experience. So in those cases, once again, usually it will be associated with, with uh, a planning approval process that will have to take place regardless of the heritage permit system. So you will have to submit your, your proposed uh, drawings, uh, staff reviews and, and prepares the, the reports that go to council. Council then reviews the, 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 the submission uh, and the recommendations from staff and they either say yes and you get a, a, a permit issued or you say no, uh, they say no and um, the property owner or um, homeowner has the uh, recourse to go to the uh, local planning appeal tribunal in which um, obviously it will be more a quasi judicial uh, court where you can, uh, you know, argue all matters of the land use planning policy and development. So this is the, 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 the initial uh, uh, proposed heritage permit process. Uh, I know that town staff and, and uh, is preparing to, to, to also uh, write their own recommendations that will go to council for council consideration and, and really then really uh, it's either in this form or it has further um, minor tweaks that really um, uh, start kind of providing you and, and, and the rest of the landowners with a, a very, very um, clear path on how to go about and, and, and uh, work with your buildings. As part of that uh, implementation uh, um, chapter, um, we go into um, uh, the, the full description of what the heritage permit review entails, the approval process and the work requiring for, for approval. So uh, we, to, to not create an extra layer of, 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 of uh, preparation that usually is associated already with um, built, uh, building permits, we are tagging along with uh, the, the elements and the drawings and the submission that you have to prepare regardless for uh, construction permits. So it's, it's just that it gets circulated to, to the planning department and heritage uh, department to, for review. We also go into uh, a, a larger description of the roles and responsibilities that the town staff will have, the heritage advisory committee will have, council as well as property owners. We go into uh, outlining a series of grants and financial assistance programs that are implemented in other municipalities. Um, and that includes anything from the CIP program that you already have in, in, in place to, to anything to uh, like uh, property tax relief programs or whatnot. And this is also part of that bundle that will go back to council for their consideration and in, in better deciding what sort of uh, grants and financial assistance are, are best suited for, for Beaton at this point in time. We, we also have a, a list of resources. Um, there, there may, for property owners, they may be, I guess, um, sometimes confusing and, and daunting to 
undertake the the the, the fixing of a historic and uh, heritage place. So um, there there are a series of uh, uh, websites and resources and toolkits that uh, they can access, and then we provide a series of land use policy updates. So this is where we really um, ensure that the official plan amendment is 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 introduced. So our uh, um, HCD um, objectives and guidelines can really be implemented in, 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 a, uh, in a more land use or legal quote unquote way. Uh, it doesn't uh, fight the parent uh, uh, land use directions that you get through an official plan. Um, there are slight revisions to the urban design guidelines that are exist already, already exist for the town. Um, and there are a series of tweaks to existing bylaws from from the, the zoning bylaw, fence bylaw, design bylaw, uh, the property standards bylaw. And uh, obviously there is the bylaw to establish the heritage permit system without which, uh, without that um, council uh, approval, you really don't have the system to, to start implementing the, 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 the recommendations put forward in that guideline. So it all has to happen and be in place so you can start using a new planning tool to, to manage the growth and, and change within B2. So all that goes into um, the third and final chapter of our, uh, of our report. And uh, I think that brings us to, to the end of the presentation. Um, I know that the presentation has been uploaded to the website. There is a lot of information uh, that we were able to convey today, but we're looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ute. And I'm just gonna pass it over to Councillor McCullen uh, to make any first remarks on the presentation or the Beaton Heritage Conservation District just in general. Thanks so much. So I did have a few things to say. The, um, the Heritage Committee, the consultants and the staff have done an absolutely fabulous job when it comes to the Beaton Heritage Conservation District. This is a super exciting time for Beaton. Uh, protecting our heritage is always important. Paying homage to our ancestors before us is necessary. Preserving our heritage, promoting our heritage, and appreciating our heritage is our duty, for it is our history that has shaped our society today. It quite literally has made us who we are. So thank you so much to everybody who has participated in all sorts of different capacities in making the Beaton Heritage Conservation District soon to be part of Beaton's history. So thanks so much to everybody. That's great. Thank you so much, Councillor McCullen. So we will pass it over to uh, any questions that members of the public may have. If you do have a question, um, I would just ask that um, everybody turn on their, uh, their cameras um, and just raise your hand and let us know um, that you are hoping to speak and then we'll ask you to unmute your microphone. And I'll just ask Leah as well, who is here in presentation to see if there is anyone here who's raising their hand to speak for a question. Yes, we have Josh Coleman. Josh, you can go ahead and unmute your mic. Can you guys see me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, like uh, Councillor McClellan was saying, thank you for the presentation you guys have put together. It was very informative. Um, on that note, I'm just wondering if you could give me uh, just some information, if, I, if I'm able to give you uh, my house, are you able to kind of tell me what designation my residence uh, is? Yes, certainly. Uh, we have a larger map, but if, uh, if you can give us your address, I can uh, kind of uh, look into the, there's a complete, in, in the report, there's a complete um, statement of a, a significance for each individual property. So we can obviously uh, uh, look into, into that and, and we'll be available to you all to, to see what, what's in, what, 
has been deemed historically and, 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 and heritage wise important in your building. But if you can just start giving us your address, that will help. Okay, um, our address is 37 Main Street West. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know my wife has tried to look into finding some history. And I mean, obviously you guys have done research uh, with this process to kind of find significant homes. And I'm just wondering, because when she's looked, uh, she really hasn't found much on our home, but I'm assuming that there has to be some kind of documentation just being its age. So I'm also just kind of wondering if there's any supporting uh, documentation or evidence of anything that might be significant to our home. Being that we were, we started the process within the last year of doing some facade updates to our home, uh, some things that were in need of repair. And we're also going to be doing some work to update our windows. Um, I know you were saying there's different levels of upkeep. Um, the wooden frames are starting to look um, a bit aged. So that was going to just be some basic repair of paint, but then the keystones above them, from my understanding of what your presentation said, might be a different process in, its, in itself because of its brickwork. So I'm just wondering uh, when might we need to actually start thinking of applying for any kind of uh, historical work permits, like when will this process kind of take place so that we might need to move forward in that direction? Um, I, I will um, let uh, um, uh, Madeline of Vanessa contribute as far as the timing. We are working hard to try and wrap up this process by the end of the year. We, we, we are hoping to go back to council with, with a recommendation and the finalized uh, guidelines uh, uh, sometime in December. Uh, once it goes to council, uh, hopefully uh, it, it receives <laughs> council approval. And at that point in time, there, there will be a, a, a series of um, elements that will have to take place like passing the bylaws so you can actually use the process. Uh, mm -hmm. There will be some uh, fixing of, of uh, tweaking of the bylaw, the, uh, the official plan. And uh, I, I, I don't know how long it will take from there, but I will let um, uh, uh, Madeline comment on that. However, I can tell you that um, I think if, if the timeline between what you need to fix and, and all, the, all the elements to be in place to implement this is specific tool. Uh, it, it doesn't don't coincide. I think there is still there is still benefit and a lot of help in, in in just going through the guidelines and seeing and using them regardless, mm -hmm. uh, just to help you in the process of you know you going ahead and, and and doing what you need to do, especially if you are tied to a specific timeline. But uh, Madeline, sure, thanks, Ute. Yeah, I think. Uh, once we get the final plan together and it goes to council from there, whether that be in December or early in the new year, it will take us a couple of months to make sure that uh, the bylaw is passed, um, should it be approved by council, um, and also that we update the necessary uh, policies and, and other bylaws that this plan will impact. Um, so I would say early spring is probably a reasonable time. Um, but again, like Ute said, if, if you are passionate about the heritage uh, features on your home um, and you want to make sympathetic um, upgrades or, or do maintenance on them, we can certainly work with you. Feel free to contact me at any time and I can provide you with my contact information to go through the plan with you um, as it stands right now. And there is, like Ute said, great guidance as to um, how you might be able to tackle some of those projects. Um, really great direction as to um, what some of those maintenance techniques might look like. Um, and we can certainly work with you if, if your timing is something that's uh, very urgent or um, otherwise, if you if you would like to wait to see how this plan sort of uh, comes down the, the funnel, um, that's great too. But we're happy to work with you to make sure that uh, we meet your needs and then hopefully we can be sympathetic to the heritage features at your home. Okay, thank you. And I, I think your home is this little yellow 
Okay, you see my cursor? It's one of those uh, little... Not really. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm let me, my let phone me so that it's quite tiny. I know, let me zoom in. I, oh, sorry. yeah, I think... Sorry, oh. wait, let me go one up. Um, I thought I did see... Yeah, I think that's our house there on the, the top one, I believe. <laughs> yeah, 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 right across the library. It's a beautiful home. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and like I said, we've recently, we uh, did some facade work, just the top gable area was starting to fall apart. So, I mean, we tried to tried to do the work that we did in uh, keeping with some of the the look of the house and its character. Yeah. But uh, yeah, moving forward now, knowing what I know, um, maybe consulting with you guys might be something that would be beneficial to the house and actually you, you your kids can can also really help um um we will wrap up obviously the guidelines and 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 uh they will be available for you to to use them as you move forward but uh it will be also interesting to hear from you as a user of the guidelines if you see there are any gaps or whatnot in in in, in trying to help you <laughs> navigate the the restoration of of uh, uh heritage home so, and I will just add, Josh, um, on our project webpage, we do have a contact there. So please leave uh, an email for us through that contact and let us know again what your property address is and that you're speaking to us during this meeting. We'd be happy to get you in touch with uh, any necessary information or a copy of the guidelines. You were also speaking about um, some history on your home. We have Vanessa Leo who's here uh, in this meeting as well. She's our heritage lead and she'd be more than happy to speak with you about uh, some of the historic elements of your home and its history if we do have information with the town. Okay. Perfect. Now I can't see the screen, but uh, I was also asking too, with the designation of it, is it considered a supporting or contributing home in Beaton? Um, from if, if the location of this map is correct, you will be a contributing uh, uh, building. Okay, thank you. Residential, yeah. Thanks, okay. Josh. We'll now go to uh, June and David, I believe, if you have a question, please unmute your microphone. Uh, yes, uh, my name is David Chambers. I live here with my wife, June, uh, we're in the historic hamlet of Bond Head. Uh, we live in a restored 1845 country inn. And uh, I must confess that I was uh, one of the founding members of Tecumseh uh, Township's uh, first LACAC, if you've ever heard of a LACAC. And uh, <clears throat> I must uh, also confess that I'm uh, no stranger to HCDs. I was involved in the Cookstown HCD and I'm presently involved in the HCD study for the, uh, for the hamlet of Bond Head. And I just want to, uh, to, to congratulate and commend you girls for the wonderful presentation that you have made tonight. Uh, it was very thorough and it was an excellent presentation uh, on HCD and heritage preservation. And I commend you for that. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Are there any other questions? Okay, so seeing none, I think that this is a, a great time to close out our meeting. We're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule, which is wonderful. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate your participation and your feedback. And again, like I mentioned, uh, we do have contact information on our project webpage. Please feel free to contact us at any time if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about the proposed plan. And we'll keep that webpage uh, up to date so you can follow along on the project's um, success. Thank, thank you. you.